continuing in our year-long theme, Pursuit. Pursuit. Somebody shout Pursuit. And, uh, but, but here recently we've been, we've been dealing uh, with the subject of community. Community. And you say, what does that have to do with pursuit? Because it is our, our, our desire to see each one of us uh, finish, finish the year strong. And uh, we, it, it, so, because finishing strong is vital to the year pursuit because we don't, we, we don't want to end the year and then stop pursuing. We want, pr- pursuit should be just, a, just an awesome part of our life. Every day we should pursue God, the things of God, the people of God, the ways of God. And so anyway, so we're, we're right now in a series on uh, community. And today I, I want to I speak to creating community, creating community. And once again, I want to go to first, first Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. It says, uh, to God's church gathering in the city of Peoria. We just make it right on down where we are right now. Just bring it, bring it down. Uh, to God's church gathering in the city of Peoria. As people who are united with Jesus, the anointed one, you have been set apart for service. You see, when you connect with Jesus, you connect with the people of God. When you connect with Jesus, you connect with your life mission. When you connect with Jesus, that's what he's telling us here. And then it says, you are called into community to live as the saints with all who invoke the name of our Lord Jesus, the anointed, the anointed. Um, so we've been dealing with this whole concept of community for a few weeks now, and I I, I, I want to carry a thought on that I began and laid the foundation with uh, Wednesday evening. So if you were here, bear with me for just a few moments, as I, I just want to kind of kind of build on it uh, uh, this morning, but. When you, when you talk about community, we have defined community uh, 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 th- that it is the relational and spiritual atmosphere where we connect to do life and ministry. I want to tweak that just a little bit this morning. Just, just bear with me because I'm, I'm really uh, asking the Holy Spirit to really help me with this whole community uh, dynamic because I, I just know it's so important to where we're headed and what God wants to do here at Fresh Start Church in each of our lives. But uh, just to kind of redefine a little bit, That community is the relational and spiritual atmosphere where we connect to do life and mission. Life and mission. I'm I'm changing ministry to mission, just so you get that. That's important to where we're going today. Uh, To do life and mission. Um, We've been talking about the last few weeks about the Acts Church atmosphere. Uh, It's recorded in Acts 2. And when, When you talk about the Acts Church and in the atmosphere which it possessed, you will know that it is. You will note that it is an atmosphere of real relationship. It is an atmosphere of unconditional love. It is an atmosphere of passionate purpose, constant connection. Because they met daily, daily they were together. They had a constant connection, and there was this move of outrageous generosity. I mean, they they would give up their own stuff. So their brothers' and sisters' needs could be met. I mean, it was an outrageous generosity in the atmosphere of, the, of this church. And, uh, and, and then there was this continual encouragement, this level of encouragement. And, and so somebody shout atmosphere. This is important where we're going today because, you see, community is atmosphere. It is the atmosphere of connection. Community is the atmosphere of connection. But when you, when you look up the definition of atmosphere, this is what you see. It is a pervasive attitude, mood, or disposition. A pervading or pervasive attitude, mood, or disposition. That definition then tells us that atmosphere then is created by people. Because people have attitudes, moods, and dispositions. So people create atmosphere. Yes. See, we learned this Wednesday night, so some of y'all are ahead, ahead, ahead of everybody else. Because you see, everybody that came in here today came in with an attitude. Everyone that came in here this morning came in with a mood. You came in with a disposition. Everyone came in here. It may have been a positive, life-giving attitude, or it may have been a stinky, nasty, grumpy attitude. I don't know where you came, but everyone came in with an attitude. And the, the weight of the congregation, 
See, I'm, I'm going to teach you something right now. What, sets an, what, what is setting the attitude for this service right now isn't the praise team. What is setting the attitude for this service right now isn't Pastor Paul. What is setting the attitude in this room and for this service right now, it's the weight of the combined attitude that we all bring into the house. That's why it's called a corporate setting. And so if the majority of the people come into the house with a faith-filled, positive, worshiping, anticipating, going after God attitude, guess what's going to happen? Heavens are going to open, God's going to pour out his spirit, and supernatural things are going to take place. We create that atmosphere for God to move in by anticipation and expectation that he wants to do something great when we come together. Now, it goes to to the negative, too. If the weight or the majority of the congregation comes in and they're low and they have no faith expectation and they've had a hard week and they're carrying that attitude in with them and they just had a fight with their spouse on the way in and they just had a really run in with their kids on the way in and there's a lot of issues going on right now and everybody comes in here and everybody walks in with with an attitude that's like, okay, I'm here. And let's get on with it because I got things that I got to do when I get done here. And we, our attitude is not expecting to encounter God. It's just go through the motions, have a religious activity, and go on with my week. But I, that kind of attitude creates a heavy atmosphere where the worship doesn't break through and the word doesn't break through. And you, and you go away saying, Pastor didn't preach very good today. Well, it wasn't because I didn't really try. And it wasn't because I didn't prepare. But the attitude in the atmosphere of the room wasn't conducive to make word and faith, which brings life. Are y'all hearing me? So if you ever walk out of a service going, man, that was the worst service I've ever been in, you may want to go check your attitude. If you're wearing a preacher out and he's preaching as hard as he's getting, but it ain't, yeah, it's just because somebody had a bad attitude. I don't know. I, I don't know. Just look at your neighbor and say, is that you? Just say, work on it. Just look at him and say, I ain't got time for that. I ain't got time. Ain't nobody got time for that. Amen. I'm just having fun with you, but this is very, this is very important to where I'm going because you see, Atmosphere is created by people. And so if I'm teaching on community and God is speaking to us and telling us we need to strengthen the community of the house, he said there must be a greater measure of atmosphere that's conducive for people to connect in life and in mission. And how is that going to take place? It's going to take place when all of us take on the attitudes that create community. Yes? Can I teach you a little bit this morning? This is so burning in my spirit, you see. And so, so the idea that I'm working with here and the thought that I'm, that I'm working with is that atmosphere is created by people. And therefore, when you, when you look at the, the Acts atmosphere, then we understand that they created a community, not just an inti- institutional church. And, and so, so the idea then is that pe- atmosphere is created by people. And we create community through activating the attitudes of the one another's. Y'all remember when I read those last week, I just went through them really quick, that there's over 50 one another's in the New Testament, how we should relate and how we should, ha- how we should relate to one another as the body of Christ, the one another's, the one another. Let, let me uh, just, just in case you weren't here last week, let me just give them to you one more time, just to some of them. Um, according to the New Testament, uh, one another's, we should love one another. Uh, we should uh, be devoted to one another. We should wash each other's feet. We should be the same mind toward one another. Build up one another. Accept one another as Christ accepted you. Admonish one another. Greet one another. Uh, eat with one another. Care for one another. Serve one another. Bear one another's burdens. Show tolerance to one another. We are members of one another. Be kind to one another. Forgive one another. Be subject to one another. Regard one another as more important. Bear with one another and forgive one another. Comfort one another. Encourage and build up one another. Stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Be hospitable to one another. Can you imagine if we had all of those one another's activated in the atmosphere of this house? 
Could you imagine what kind of atmosphere that would create? I'm telling you, you couldn't keep the people out of here if they felt like that's the kind of atmosphere that is prevailing in that house. That, that, that I want to go there because if I go there, I know I'm going to be accepted. I know I'm going to be loved. I know somebody's going to bear my burden. I know, are y'all, y'all getting the idea? You see, when this happens, it, 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 I believe it was through these attitudes that the New Testament church changed the world. Amen. And, and, and because they had these attitudes going on in the church, then the result was they had true biblical community. And this community fu- fueled their expectation. And, and what I mean by that is they actually looked forward to getting together. That's why they did it daily. Daily they met in the temple. Daily they met house to house. Daily, they, why did they do that? Oh, they were just new Christians and they were just excited. Well, yeah, that's probably part of it. But they knew when they came together, there was going to be an amazing life-giving atmosphere that they moved into that it fueled their anticipation. And they said, I can't wait to get back with that group of people because when I get there, I'm going to be encouraged. When I get there, I'm going to be loved. When I get there, I'm going to be strengthened. Are y'all, are y'all, y'all hearing what I'm saying? You understand where I'm going? Because if, see, if we get this, then we won't be, it won't be trying to pull teeth to get people to come together. You will not be able to keep them apart. Somebody say yes. So when the church began, they had this amazing community, and they, just, they couldn't wait. They couldn't wait to be with each other. They anticipated what was going to happen when they came together. Not only were they expecting to experience the presence of God, and they did. Not only were they expecting to see signs and wonders and miracles and healings and God do some amazing things, uh, it, 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 they saw all of that. But I guarantee you this was the prevailing atmosphere that was conducive to all those things uh, taking place. You see, what we have to understand, guys, is this, is that God is, is very committed to creating community in his church. Do you realize that that 44% of the letters written in the New Testament talk to us about how we should get along with one another? Only 4% talk about spiritual gifts. We are passionate in this church for spiritual gifts. We are passionate to see the the, the, uh, activation of spiritual gifts. We want to see that take place in our lives and uh, as believers and and flowing through us. Uh, but, but, But you have to understand, we would fight for someone that begin to come in and say spiritual gifts are no longer to be activated, and that we would fight for that. But only 4% of the New Testament talks about it. 44% talks about how we should get along with one another and how we should have relationships and healthy relationships with one another. And you know what? We don't even think about that. We just go on through our life, and maybe I get a relationship in the house of God, and maybe I don't have relationships in the house of God, but 44%, I think God is trying to tell us something. God knew, even in this New Testament church, they were going to need some help to get along with one another, but he knew if they did not get along with one another and love one another and have a passion with one another and build life and mission together, they would ne- he would never be able to accomplish what he wants to fully accomplish through the church, and that is to be a church that will change the world. Somebody say yes. I'm just, I'm just working on this a little more to lay this foundation for us. Because you see, decades, only decades, only decades after this amazing church began in the earth. Just decades after I saw one of the greatest moves of God. And we had one of the greatest impacts of any church ever. Decades later, we come to Hebrews Chapter 10, verse 24. It says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Let me read another translation. The voice translation says it. Let, I love this. Let us consider how to inspire each other to greater love and to righteous deeds. Not forgetting together as a community. Not forgetting together as a community as some have forgotten. But encouraging one another, especially as the day of his return approaches. Decades later, the church was losing community. He said, don't forget. Your community. Don't forget. He said, many have already done it. Many has already forsaken the community. They have forgotten the community. They've given up on the community. And so the antidote for this, watch. 
He said the antidote for this is you must spur one another on. And you must encourage one another as the day approaches. Uh, see, see what, we, what we understand here is prophetically, uh, when we get to the end of time, before the return of Jesus Christ, there's going to be a falling away. There's going to be an abandonment. Matter of fact, the phrase forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, the word forsaken there uh, literally means to abandon. Abandon. So he, he watch me. Most of the time when we see this scripture, the preacher's going to preach on about coming to church more often. Now, obviously, that you can do that, and obviously it has a meaning toward that because the, the, the phrase assembled together is, is actually taken. The Greek word, is, is a, is the, its root is found in the word synagogue. So it is talking about gathering in a place where you can experience the presence of God, where, the, where God dwells. He said, do not forsake. The gathering into the presence of God, where a place that you can experience, where God comes down. Do not, do not forsake that. But it's deeper than that. Because he's not just talking about people being inconsistent in church attendance. He, he uses the word abandon. He doesn't use the word slacking off, not coming as often as you should. He uses the word abandon. He said, you have been forsaken. You're, you have abandoned your assembling together. You have abandoned your connection with one another. The word literally means to separate connection with. Uh, somebody needs to hear me. Separate the connection with. You see, you see. Uh, obviously, I believe that church attendance is, is important. And as consistent as you can be in it, uh, the more powerful it is in our lives. Are y'all hearing me? But we live in a day where that is no longer valued. And people come when they want and when they don't want. But what they don't understand is they're being set up. They've been set up for an end time move of the enemy that's going to cause some things that's going to happen. And it's going to cause some people to abandon their connecting with one. You realize you can come here every Sunday and never connect with anyone. You can come here every Sunday, every Wednesday and be a part of everything but never connect. Why? Because until we connect, we cannot be a community. And until we become a community, we can't be the church that God has dreamed that we should be. Somebody say yes. That's a good word right there. And he said the way to counter this is spur one another and encourage one another. The closer you get to the day of the appearing of Jesus Christ, he said there must be more encouragement. There must be more spurring one another on. Oh, my God, I feel this deep in my spirit. So can I just break this, this verse down just a little bit? I'll just work on it. First of all, he says, let us consider. Let us consider. This is the word that he's bearing down on. Let us. Somebody say, let us. In Hebrews 10, 22, he said, let us draw near in faith. In Hebrews 10, 24, he said, let us hold fast in hope. In Hebrews 10, uh, excuse me, 23, then in Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another. Let us consider. The word consider uh, there means to put one's mind on something closely, cautiously, carefully, and clearly. In other words, he's telling us as the people of God, you really need to be decisive. And you really need uh, to be intentional in thought when it comes to one another. When it comes to being a part of the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, what, what he's telling us then is that, that we need to understand that, that only decades have passed. Decades, only in decades, they, they're losing their community. They're losing their ability to walk together and do life and mission together. And so when he, when, when he starts writing here in Hebrews, he said, let us consider. It is a present tense form, which means to be in continual consideration of how to spur, to stimulate other believers on how to motivate and how to cultivate one another to a higher level of living while keeping an eternal perspective. He said, you need to help one another. Get all you can get out of life right now. But don't forget, he's coming soon. And you got to make sure that your passion of pursuing each other and the thing that God has for you to do, that the foundation of it is that one day, I still believe it, though many have, have given up on it. He will split that eastern sky. There will be a trumpet sounding. There will be a release of gravity on the men and the women of God, and we will meet 
him and those that have gone before us in the air. Somebody say yes. This is very important uh, to us. Because the Hebrews, the, the, whole, the whole book of Hebrews, and especially this, this portion of Scripture here, uh, was written to reorient a community of believers who have been disoriented by the difficulty of the day that they are living in. In other words, their faith is being stretched to the limit. They're, they're encountering some things that they did not ever think they would have to encounter as the children of God. And they're not seeing some things that, that the New Testament church said, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to take place. Uh, the point being is they thought this thing would be wrapped up before now and it would all be good. But it's not. And their faith is positioning them in a place where they are undergoing great struggle and great suffering. And they did not realize this was going to take place. And so, so, what, so what, he, what he's telling us here is then that, that we must let us consider, let us consider one another. He's telling us community doesn't just happen, and it doesn't just keep happening. Are y'all hearing me? It doesn't just happen, and it doesn't just keep happening. That's why he uses the word consider, and, 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 and he uses it in, in present tense, and that you've got to keep on doing this you got to keep on, in your mind, thinking about each other, believing in each other, caring for each other. Are y'all hearing me? And he said, as you get closer to the end of this thing and you begin to step into a prophetic hour, it is more important than ever that the people of God understand how to encourage and how to spur each other on. Yes? Yeah, this is why separating right now, it could, be, could, could take the life out of you. This is no time to disconnect from the body of Christ. This is no time to disconnect from a people that have walked in life with you. This is the time to bear down and connect like we have never connected before. Somebody say, yes, I'm preaching like a pastor this morning. Lord, help us. Spur, encourage. This word spur literally means to sharpen, to spur. It, it, it means to sharpen one's mind. It means to incite to action. That, that when you are spurring and you are encouraging one another, it means to speak. Everybody shout speak with intense emotion, feelings, conviction, enabling someone to meet some difficult task that is ahead of them. This, this, this is so powerful. Ephesians 4, 29 speaks to this. It says, let, let no corrupt words proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for, nece- for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. The, the, this word stir or spur or inspire can be positive or negative. The same word can be used in a positive or a negative environment. It, it, it can inspire us or it can irritate us. I hope that I inspire you today, but I might irritate you. I don't know. It depends on what kind of mood you're in. This, this, this is so important because it, it tells us here that we, we are to speak with intense emotion and feeling and conviction to one another. How long has it been? Since someone has spoken to you on that level. Oh, we speak to each other, right? Sometimes we're very casual in our conversation. But when's the last time someone spoke to you with an intensity that caused something to jump up on the inside of you? When's the last time somebody spoke to you with such passion and conviction that it broke the power of depression off your life? I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to get us an understanding here. That we have to press beyond shallow relationships that only speaks shallow things. And that we have to become so connected to one another that we know our brother and sister so well. That we know when they're going through something or we can sense in the spirit what's going on in their life. And we can walk up to them. We can speak a thing to them that that pierces the darkness and looses the chains and causes them to rise up and believe they can do something great in their life. Cause them to believe there is hope. Cause them to believe they can get up and go on. Yes, yes, because here, here, please, as I press into this, understand this, 
not everyone has a right to speak into your life. Not everyone. What I'm talking about is not just letting anyone talk to you about you, but letting someone that loves you, letting someone that cares about you, letting someone that has relationship with you look at you and speak. And the, the word that they speak might be a warning. The word that they speak might just be an encouragement. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you got to speak and to wake. Sometimes I got to say a thing to all of you that's going to wake us up. Sometimes, you know, you know if, you, if you're in a, in a car with somebody and you're headed down the freeway at, at 70 miles an hour and you look over at them and they're nodding off to sleep, you're not going to, excuse me, excuse me, would you mind waking up before we crash and all die right here? Excuse me. I don't think so. I think it's like, wake up! Now that is inspirational speech right there. If you wonder why, yeah, it's to wake us up. Not in, not in the natural, but in the spirit. Somebody's got to speak passionately. Somebody's got to speak with conviction. Somebody's got to speak with an intensity to wake the spirit man up. We need to learn to have such a relationship with one another that we can begin to speak on that level that causes the man that is asleep to be awakened on the inside of us. We've got to give each other permission to speak truth in love. Somebody say yes. Oh, this is a good word right here. Somebody getting ready to get it. He's talking about speaking grace words. Yes? What does God's grace do? God's grace restores and heals. He says, speak in such a way with one another that it brings grace. It imparts grace to those that hear it. You see, our words need to create hope where there's despair. It needs to heal spirits that have been broken and wounded. A community speaks grace. It spurs, it stimulates, it inspires people to dream. It enables them then to fulfill that dream in their life because we continue to speak one another. Yes? Then he says, listen. So I'm just breaking this verse down this morning. It's just real simple. Let us consider. Let us inspire. Let us spur one another on toward love. Stir up love and good works. And when I was looking at that, I thought, that, that's so awesome. Because our relationships with one another ought, ought to move, we ought to move each other to a higher level of love and good works. Notice here, please, that it's not just enough to experience love. And it's not just enough to be active in doing good works. That we have a responsibility to empower each other to love and to good works. See, this is where we have to break out of just me and Jesus, and I'm responsible for my relationship only. And understand, if we're going to have true community, we have to go beyond just me and Jesus and my relationship with him. That I have a brother and a sister that I am in relationship with, and I have a responsibility to spur them on into the revelation of love and into the revelation of good works. Yes, that I, I have to make sure that my brother and my sister get all the love they need and are inspired to rise up and do great things for God. Oh, God, help me preach this today. See, love, each one of us, we are born for love. We are born for love. God is love. And our Bible teaches us that the love of God has already been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The, the, the context of that verse about the love of God being poured out by the Holy Spirit, it, it said he has poured out, uh, that the love of God is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Watch me. Uh, because he has loved us, and because he loved us, he went to the cross for us while we were still sinners, while we were still weak, while we were still broken down, while we still had no strength left. He went ahead and went to the cross for us. He loved us to go for us. Y'all ain't hearing me right now. See, I'm talking about the atmosphere of love. The atmosphere of love understands if I pour it out, if I release it, it's going to strengthen my brother. It's going to help my brother. It's going to save my sister. It's going to say, though they may not be in a situation now where even I really want to love them, but if I go ahead and love them, believing that it, my love, that the love of God through me might change their life, I will keep on 
loving. You know how to, you know how to get filled with the love of God? Breathe God in and exhale. Because God is love. And the more time we breathe in the things of God and the spirit of God, the more love we can release in the world that is around us. Somebody say yes. You see, it's important that, that we understand this. Because see, love opens doors. Love removes all limitation. This is what God has done for us. Love is our motivation, but good works are mission. I said love is the motivation. God's motivation is love. Everything that we see around us is because God is love. For God so loved the world uh, that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. The love of God creates an atmosphere that brings transformation into the earth. And when you and I live and release the love of God around us, that is an unconditional, sacrificial, others first, me second kind of love. When we begin to do that, it loses transformation. You want to change somebody's life? Love them. Love them without condition. Love them without end. Love Love them, love them, love them, and watch them be changed. Yes. He said we should spur one another on toward love, toward love. And and then he said love and good works. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. This is is one of my all-time life verses, because the revelation of this verse changes everything. You see, if you, if you study Ephesians chapter 2, then you understand that Paul goes overboard to let us know we are not saved by works. We are not saved by good works, but we are saved in two good works. Wow. Let that sink in. This is what this verse is teaching us. I'm not saved by good works. I'm saved by grace. But when I am saved, I'm saved into good works. In other words, the dream, the destiny, the plan, the life, I can't get to it until I receive Christ. And I, when I am born again, I am born again into good works. Works that he's already planned. Pre-planned, it says. Pre-arranged, it's talking about a prearranged sphere of action. That God has set out good works for me to walk in. Good works for me to live out in my life. Good things for me to accomplish. Titus 1.8 says we should love what is good. Titus 2.14 says be zealous for good works. Titus 3.1 says be ready for every good work. Titus 3.14 says maintain good works. I want you to know something, man. God has an amazing plan over your life. It is a prepared beforehand plan, a prearranged sphere of action, an assignment, a destiny, a mission, a calling is for you today. And he said, listen, when we get to the end of this thing, there's going to be a lot of people that's going to get disconnected. But what they don't understand, if they disconnect from each other, they're not going to have the courage. They're going to have to be encouraged. They're going to have to be encouraged. Somebody's going to have to strengthen them. Somebody's going to have to spur them on. Somebody's going to have to give them words of grace to keep them on track to believe that God still has great things for them to accomplish. In other words, community keeps the call alive. Community keeps me pressing on. Community keeps me. I'm not by myself trying to accomplish something for God. I'm walking with God, and he's already been there and back. And if I walk with him, I'm going to walk up into the greater destiny and dream of my life. But I will not be able to sustain it unless I have somebody walking with me to say, come on, we can do this. Come on, we can make this dream a reality. Are y'all hearing me? See, there are three levels of relationship everybody ought to have in their life. The first relationship is you ought to have somebody ahead of you, walking ahead of you. There ought to be someone in your life that's living the dream that God has put in your heart. 
There ought to be somebody out there that's walking in it, that's living in it. They paid the price. They've lived the years. They've sacrificed. They've done all they know to do to get there. And today, you look at me and say, wow, I want to be there one day. Wow, that's the dream I have. I, 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 just, I see that. I see. That's what I see my life becoming. I've seen that. And then you need somebody ahead of you. Why? Because they can reach out and elevate you and help you step to a higher place of your dream. Yes, listen, if you know it all and you don't need no help, you're pretty much done going where you're going to go. Everybody needs a hand up to get where God has called them to be. Somebody say yes. And then you need somebody that will walk beside you. You need somebody that, that, that's walking with you, that's at the same place of the dream and the life and the living and the mission. They're right there with you. They, they understand your emotions. They understand the, the tests. They understand the stress. They understand the, the failures that you're walking through because they've been through the same things, and, and they're going through the same things. And when you get together, you, you can share. You can stimulate one another. You can encourage one another. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, man. I was feeling that the other day myself. And you, In your conversation, you can just help each other so much. You know. And, and so everybody needs somebody that's ahead of them, and everybody needs somebody that walks beside them, and everybody needs somebody that's behind them. Everybody needs somebody that's walking out the dream. Somebody, somebody somewhere is looking at you saying, that, that's where I want to be. That's what I want to become. That's how I want to live. I need somebody to walk. I need somebody just like the person is walking in front of you. You're walking. In, I'm telling you, if you've got those three levels, then you have, a, you have a healthy life because you got somebody ahead of you that's pulling you up, somebody that's walking beside you that's holding you up, and somebody behind you that you're going to reach back out of your own self and spend time to see the potential in them become a reality and watch them. Watch them live the dream because if you make the dream happen for them, God will make the dream happen for you. And you got a pretty good team going right there. And teamwork makes the dream work. Somebody say, yeah. He said, walk in it. It keeps the dream alive, you see. Every person has a destiny. Every person has a purpose. Dream has a God. A God has a dream over your life today. And community is the place where this, where this challenge, where we challenge one another. Take the lid off. Live, live large. Expand your life. Encourage one another. Spur one another on. See, the purpose of community is to keep the ship. To keep us in the ship. So what are you talking about? Paul had this revelation. Actually, the early church had a revelation uh, where the ship was one of the symbols of the early church. Paul spent a lot of time on a ship. When you talk about a ship, you're talking about a vessel with a mission. Paul was a man with a mission. Paul spent a lot of time. If it wouldn't have been for a ship, he could have never conquered uh, the cities that he did with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Colossians and Ephesus and uh, uh, 